everyone. Welcome to episode six. I'm Sam, and I'm here with Jonathan, as usual. And before we get started, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment so you can stay update on all our weekly topics and discussions about everything Trugal. And I'm going to go ahead and let you kick off our topic today, Jonathan. Excellent. So today I want to speak about something I call solution monomania. Yeah, I think I say that word right. So monomania, monomania is an actual word, um, and it's when you're overly focused on a single thing. And what we find very often is when it comes to projects, everyone starts focusing way too much just on the solution and they lose their connectivity to the problem. And so let me, let me give you a simple analogy. You cut your finger, you apply a Band-Aid. Problem, solution, really simple. But is the problem that you, when after you cut your finger that you need a Band-Aid or that your finger's bleeding? That distinction alone, I would say probably is the cause of billions of dollars of waste uh, every year. I'll say millions, but let's tens of millions uh, for sure. I'd say probably billions. And again, it goes back to something, you know, we keep talking about the, the sheer amount of waste out there. How is it possible that all these projects or people are starting projects or going through projects that are resulting in all this waste that everyone knows is, you know, whatever, whatever statistic you want to use, if it's at least 30%, sometimes 70% of all projects fail, what are, what are all the reasons, you know, how is this all possible? One of the main problems is solution monomania and losing that connectivity is, like I said, the, the key problem. And the, and the idea of the monomania, which is a cool word, actually, it's the first time I've heard it too. You're, you're springing it on me and I love it. it it's the, that, but the, but the solution monomania could actually still drive a good result. It's that disconnectedness from the solution to an actual legitimate problem that's the real killer. Because by the time you put your solution into production or into play or operationalize that, however you want to talk about it, nobody cares anymore because it's not solving what you originally set out to solve or the original need or the why behind the project is no longer relevant. And I think that there's a, a trend that we're trying to articulate that we see quite frequently in the business space, which is if there was a good reason to do project work, it's somehow along the way it gets dissociated from the solution you're building. That's, that's the real thing you're talking about, right? 100%. The, the, the problem that you're trying to solve, the why, is always your foundation. That's the part that never moves unless the problem changes. But that's the part that you always want to keep your most energy on in terms of maintaining agility. You know, like when, when we last, last week, we talked about business analysis and you know, the, the translation and, and everybody being on the same page. And I would say that one of the keys, one of the things that I'm always looking for in a project is when there are problems either with there being no requirements process or the requirements process is failing or people are you know blaming people for why the tech, you know technology is is, aim, is ending up the way it is and a lot of the time the problem there that when i see that a lot of the red flag is that people have lost sight of why you're trying to do whatever you're trying to do why you're trying to build whatever you're building or whatever solution you're you're, you're trying to uh, implement so I don't know, if Sam, if that uh, resonates at all. It definitely resonates. And we're now starting to do what we always do, which is we're taking a very simple premise and now all the different factors that affect it are starting to come into play around, okay, well, how does a, how does a problem which drives activity get separated, dissociated fundamentally from the project itself or the activity itself? So you have this burning platform, you start all this activity, and then all of a sudden, you get a few months in and now everyone's working towards something and people have totally forgotten why they're trying to solve or what they're trying to solve and how does this happen? But it happens frequently. It seems kind of crazy when you talk about it like this, but I think there's a lot of reasons what I was trying to say. It, it's complicated like most things we talk about and there's psychological factors, there's political factors, there's often business culture and business maturity factors. But if you start really upstream, I think the first thing I'd like to comment on is a lot of times that problem that originally drove the project, it started in a room with less people. You know, the room where the sausage gets made is where the problem is being discussed. And mm -hmm. then transparency is a big, a big that's, dimension of it, how many people start losing track of it. 
hundred percent. It starts, and we talked one time about strategy not being the provenance of just you know leadership; that it has to translate into how it, everybody understanding it and being part of it uh, throughout the organization. Same thing with the project. When these projects start and someone makes a decision, especially implementing some large ERP or what any enterprise level project, and there is a very excellent transparency on what problem is trying to be solved. That's boom. That you're already starting this this big you know ball uh, rock going down a hill that's going to collect all this other waste and end up in some ma massive destruction. So I agree. You know, transparency at the outset, critical. And and that's where, if you don't have transparency, and I would even say, as far as a lot of bigger projects, they don't have continuity very quickly of whoever decided this is a problem, whoever put the energy into solving it, and they create a team. The team was actually never even briefed a lot of the time on why they're doing the project or everyone had, didn't have to sign off or get educated on the business problem they're trying to solve, their job or their assignment is the execution toward a solution from the start. So you could even say that it's not even, well, transparency is always an issue because they should be able to access why the project is happening and people should be inquisitive and want to know that. But oftentimes when I build a project team, I'm already starting off the wrong foot because I may know why I need the project but if I'm just hiring people to do things, their goal right off the bat is to do the things, to make the Band-Aid, even if the wound is already healed. How are they supposed to associate the problem that somebody decided was important with their work if they were never told and they're never incentivized to keep that front of mind? And I think that now we're talking about that's that first step where things go materially wrong in these projects. People don't think it's important. There's still a lot of a need to know culture that I think is pervasive in project work, especially in larger projects where they feel like it's cumbersome to onboard people and tell them all of the, the, the high level stuff, you know? And everyone talks about the pace of change, how technology is changing so fast, how the need, you know, the market shifting so fast, et cetera. Well, if you're not transparent about why you're solving something and people are off executing based on some solution that you designated for the problem, well, it's likely something in the problem is going to change during the lifetime of some large project. I mean, it can't possibly be true that everything is getting faster and yet projects you know, don't need this transparency and don't need people to understand the why. In fact, I would say that a majority of even successful projects, projects where people say, we implemented the solution, we implemented the technology, never result, well, no, it's not just me saying this, this is the, the data is very conclusive, don't result, result in any intended business benefit. There are benefits, and we'll talk, I'll talk about benefits in a second, but it doesn't actually solve the problem that, what, you know, that, that was the reason why the project was started. That happens all the time. Well, and if you that's... don't have any association to the execution to why the project is being done, then it's very easy to succeed in, in executing whatever you were. And like you said, not providing any tangible value, not providing any, any remit that makes any sense anymore. Especially for longer projects and it, 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 it more complex, it gets more and more dangerous as you go if you don't have those linked together. And I see this a lot of times even uh, with compliance. Uh, uh, when, when an ERP or something is implemented uh, because it, it's addressing some sort of compliance reason, some documentation that needs to be maintained or something around the area that you would think doesn't change that often, you know, a compliance regime of some sort. Um, but then often there is a change. There's some sort of change in, in either how the compliance needs to be addressed. Maybe suddenly, maybe there was a, a very document intensive process and then whichever government agency shifted to some online process and you don't need all that heavy documentation and you don't need to store it somewhere distinctly because there's, some, there's a, 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 an online process or something like that. And yet whatever the ER, all these other aspects of that are ERP, are still pushing forward and actually get implemented um, and sometimes actually cause more harm than good because all those other aspects of that ERP that everyone's trying to squeeze in, you know, a, a circle into a square don't actually work that well and all these workarounds, et cetera, and the original reason is gone. You know, so like think about the back to the Band-Aid example. The reason why the distinction is important, even in that simple example, is let's say when you're off going to get the Band-Aid, um, you realize that uh, it's a much deeper cut. The problem's much bigger than you thought. And the Band-Aid, it's going to bleed right through the, that, that Band-Aid. 
or let's say the bleeding stops and you don't need the Band-Aid anymore. This is like, literally it's that simple, that example. Now, most of these ERPs, it's much more complex problem. And so think about if somebody's, you know, bangs their head and, you know, you need to get them to a hospital to be assessed. Now you're gonna have what we call objectives. So you have your problem, ultimate solution of the person being healthy. And, but in the middle, in between that, you set yourself objectives in the project or mini solutions that could include get the person to an ambulance get the person from the ambulance to the, you know, or get the person to the emergency room. The problem is even with those objectives, you need to maintain the why, because I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll wrap up my little soliloquy here, but uh, it's, if let's say you, f the, the emergency room is 15 minutes away and um, the ambulance is going to take three hours. Well, do you still wait for the ambulance or do you drive the person? So that's shifted now, but if the people that are trying to, uh, if, the, if someone was assigned to get the ambulance, they're still off doing that, even though the facts have changed and you, you, know, you know now that you're going to drive the person. And actually, now you have two different groups solving the same problem. Uh, and again, very common in, 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 in the business context. It, it goes on and on like that, too. And, you know, the cut example is so simple, but so effective. And I think articulating what Jonathan just said, which is that the problems change. I think that's the real insight. And that's what a lot of people in the beginning, it's hard to compute. I think there used to be, you know, to go back to our waterfall versus agile conversations, waterfall used to be, okay, solid problem, solid solution. Now let's work for six to 12 to two years on how to solve it. And they kind of consider them static. In agile, everyone kind of understands now, okay, we found a solid problem same premise, static problem. And now the solution, we know there has to be flexibility. It has to live and breathe as the project progresses, as we learn, as we kind of understand and we iterate. And now everyone's totally sold on that. Now, what no one's really talking about that I think we're trying to talk about now is the reality is there was never a static problem. It's a moving problem and a moving solution. That's how it always is in reality. And when you look at the progression of understanding that flexibility, I don't think it's far-fetched. But I think for a lot of people, that's super intimidating because if you have a moving target on what you're trying to solve and you have a moving target on how you're going to solve it, well, you may just throw up your hands in frustration and say, well, what's the point of project planning? How does anyone ever get anything done? But that's what we struggle with. If you're an agile team, and like I said, you have a, like Jonathan saw, you have a cut on your forehead and it's bleeding into your eye and you're thinking, okay, this is a huge problem I can't see. And you're starting to build glasses or like protective eyewear you could be iterating that for months. And then by the time you get back to the stakeholders, the cut has healed and the bleeding has stopped. The problem itself has changed fundamentally. The root of the problem has changed fundamentally. There's nothing, you'll show up with your glasses and they'll be like, what are you, what are you even bringing this here for? Like this has already moved on. But that's really hard for people to grasp because you've got multiple moving targets, but that's real life. That's the, that's the, the thing that, that throws people off. You can't just assume these things are static. And each one of these solutions, you know, so let's say somebody finds a workaround in, in their systems at work or in, in Sam's example, you know, they, they say, oh, I can use these glasses. The problem is then the solution monomania that takes over is they start really focusing on the benefits of, and they start defending and justifying their solution. And that becomes an entrenched and embedded group that now that's gonna go forward no matter what. And I, I would say that anytime anyone talks in a project to me about benefits, all the benefits of the system, you know, and they start listing it, I'm already, my red flag is, is already up because you shouldn't just be thinking about all the extras that we get with this. It's not like projects are, shouldn't be like goodie bags, you know, that you, you know, you get at the, you know, when you, when you leave some party or something and you kind of look through it and say, oh, that's cool. And that's wonderful. And that's great. The, you have to realize that all these solutions you're paying for from your profit. So it'd be like looking at a goodie bag and saying, you know, oh, this is great, but now would you pay for that goodie bag? Well, I don't know, you know, right out of my pocket. I don't know that I'm going to be, you know, pay for Pez dispenser. It's pretty cool. You know, I'm happy I have one now, but, uh, or whatever, you know, um, might be a find in there, but it's definitely not something that uh, um, a business should be paying their money for. And yet now we have a manager who's looking at 
two different solutions that people are working on. And well, we don't want to offend this one. Don't want to offend this one. Let's let's figure out how all these benefits can kind of all work together and be great for us instead of being like, what the heck is every, what the heck is going on here? Why are we wasting our time with uh, building all these different solutions? And I don't even want to be in this meeting. Yeah. So. Well, and, it, and it's so it becomes more obvious when you always talk about things in relation to the individual when you're making analogies that are rooted to the individual and like you just said it's such an apt one again with the goodie bags i mean you can shop all day but anyone with financial sense usually interrogates their financial decisions but the crazy thing and the most dangerous thing about all this project work is that once you spin up a team if you don't have a solid foundation the team is working they're desperately if they're just executing they want you to love what they build because that's their job now you've got psychological and you've got human factors and you've got a group dynamic where even if they've totally forgotten what they're trying to solve they're trying to impress you because they need you to validate their work and they need the budget to be continued and the craziest part is the person who had the problem in the first place often forgets why they even started the project especially if it's not well documented and then they get like jonathan said they're in there watch letting people demonstrate to them a dog and pony show and just in the moment like chasing a squirrel like wow that's really cool but now we're totally off where we started and why we even started doing the work and this can go on for millions of dollars and months and months and months and nobody says where's the project charter did we write down the problem and the goal did we actually have we kept continuity in what we originally set out to do and how we're measuring how to achieve it it's the basics and it all happens right up front and this is what we're always harping on, which is don't start the project unless you have something that's worth solving and you know it has staying power. And you know that even though everything in life is a moving target, the variability for what you're looking at is low enough or the risk is low enough for something materially changing on you that the effort will be worth it from the onset. I mean, it's not really complicated calculations. It's just, it's just keeping this in mind. I'm going to carry through the analogy a little bit because you, you said about how the project team gets excited to show it. So let's say, you know, I look down, and I see blood on my finger. I say, oh, honey, can you get me a Band-Aid? And she goes off and she's looking for a Band-Aid. And then she goes, you know what? He loves superheroes. L let me find, I know we have a Batman Band-Aid somewhere. And they st she starts searching through all the stuff and, and then says, oh my gosh, this whole cabinet is a mess. I'm going to, let me clean it up a little bit. And then, I, okay, I, I get you all. A long time ago, I looked down and realized, oh, that's ketchup. And so I wipe it off and the problem's not even there anymore. And she's off getting a Band-Aid, you know, and, and spending time, you know, trying to make it the best Band-Aid possible. This is exactly, I mean, literally, you could see this in almost every organization in project work. It actually happens exactly like that. And when you're talking about profit, when you're talking about what you're paying for, would in that moment you pay for the Batman Band-Aid if if you're not even sure if you're bleeding yet, you know, like, and let's not get started on problem analysis. Like we're, we're assuming for the sake of this podcast that there's, that there's a real problem that's been analyzed. Although I, don't, I feel like okay. we're flirting. I feel like we're flirting with it already though. The problem analysis is a deep black hole, um, a super important one, but yeah. Yeah. I, I, I well, don't know if we're, we might have to yeah, delve go, into it a little bit, but go, yeah, go, go, no, 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 no. Like you said, I think we might need to save it for you guys for a more I, exciting and expansive day. At a minimum, though, you start getting a sense of prioritization because let's say while, you know, someone's off getting the Band-Aid, you trip, you know, and you hurt yourself or something, you know, uh, um, like the magnitude of problem is always changing in real life. Everything's always shifting. You know, you get a phone call suddenly while you're trying to do one thing and you find out some bad news and somebody need, you know, needs your help or something like that's how business is happening in real life. Oh, I see yeah. I'm triggering something. No, oh, no, I was just oh. commenting on, I'm enjoying your, you, the senior laying out, which I feel like is actually happening in Adam's house probably, but it actually happens in business too, this crazy band-aid analogy. Because the one thing I wanted to add to the story that I think is, is very applicable to organizations is when, by the time you found out a ketchup on your finger to complete that narrative, when she comes back with the band-aid options, you're too embarrassed to say that it was ketchup and you will still consider the band-aids and you will take them and pretend to put them on, even though you don't even have a cut. That happens all the time too. Yeah, like, I once, like once that's project so out just, of the bag. Yeah, I'll put a Batman Band-Aid on. I like, you know, it's a, I'll think of superheroes during the day or something. But or every day you'll squirt ketchup on the same place to make sure nobody knows that it was ketchup in the first place. And now, now I'm starting to play with it a little too much. But I see this. I see this happening. That's a little bit where you're getting into goofy, sort of almost like malintent. Can Can you think of, of any? Can you think of an example? I don't want to put you on the spot here. 
uh, Sam, I, I can think of so many, but I, but they all start, um, like, we don't want to reveal, uh, you know, specific scenarios. Uh. Yeah, I think let's all think about one together. If anyone's listening to you can think about how this happens to you. I think a lot of times it's not like so severe. It's where somebody lobbied to get something solved, or they prioritize it. And then really, they realize as they kind of dig into the problem a little bit more that it might not be so significant as they thought but they're already committed. They've already been given time on their soapbox. So they're going to say like, this is super critical, you know, when it may not be. I think that's even probably a more common example than like, hey, I said there was a problem here and there just wasn't anything here. Um, and that could be a lot of times, let's say this as an example, shared services. So a lot of finance, HR, marketing, they may have a problem where one of their creative processes is broken, or let's say in finance, one of their billing systems is not working correctly, and they rally a ton of things around it. But in the end of the day, that's not actually affecting how the business interacts with customers or affects this and that. And then, you know, when they start to get a lot of resources their way, they start to measure how it's actually going to impact the customer experience, and the answer is zero. They don't back down. They'll still say, like, we need this system upgrade or we need this, even though there's really not a strong business case or a, a, like a, a problem organizationally that sponsors it, except somebody for their area says, this would really help my people or this would make this a lot easier. And that's not to say that those kind of problems aren't warranted, but a lot of times it's kind of people, once they start emotionally appealing for their group or for their cause, it's hard for them to just back away. And I know that's still kind of general. I don't have a really good technical example off the off the edge of my, you know, well, my brain, but I think it's just think, momentum a lot of the time. I think I once gave an example of an HRS system, you, you know, human resource system. And the objective that the company has is to standardize their roles worldwide, start thinking about how they might be able to leverage people better, something like that. But along the way, they implemented the HRS system, but they didn't standardize any roles. You know, that happens all the time. You know, like that people are associating a solution with certain benefits, but because they're not articulated very clearly and they're not set as the definition of success or the measure of success, uh, it gets divorced. And then you end up having a scenario where, and, and Sam said it a little bit earlier, because these enterprise projects go on long after the time of the whoever generated the energy for the project is long gone um, or has moved on to something something else, um, you, you almost always have some disconnect between why are we doing this? And it just reverts to the benefits. You know, everyone says, oh, this will help me this way. This will help me this way. And, you know, but again, it's just not a way that you, that, that's goody bad, bad kind of thinking in terms of uh, problem solving with your money in a business. And the part you bring up there, especially about the roles and the momentum and people having left and gone, when you have projects that span over years, there's a lot of that too. When you talk about, okay, when is the, pro the problem disappeared and when somebody still lobbied hard for it, a lot of times it's if you've walked into a project role where you're being graded on it finishing successfully, you'll champion that project. It doesn't even matter. You may not even have been there, like you said, initiating that project. The fact is if your job is to... Is to see it through politically it doesn't even matter anymore i mean it's just people well, people drive project work all the time most projects that lose their association with a very specific measurable problem that they're that they're addressing and, and an important one has to be a, a you know it, it has to be a priority they they start sputtering and they stall and then they the the people that are are responsible for execution they start, you know, there's, there's more and more pressure on them. And then the company brings in people whose only purpose is to get this project done, see it over the finish line. So now you have people that are brought in with the sole objective of implementing the solution. And they themselves might not be very clear on what problem was, was originally uh, trying to be solved. So now you have even more embedded energy uh, just to implement the solution or get the project done, whatever that means to people, uh, as opposed to you know, what, what was the, what was our before state? What was before this project started? And can we measure the improvement, the, whatever the objective was, um, can we measure that and say this was successful or are we just declaring success because now we have the HRS system or we have whatever it is that, uh, you know, was the, you know, became this, the, the monomania. Well, from, from around some of the factors you just mentioned, we're talking about, Every project wants to succeed, even because 
success are still, again, tied back to just the activity that we set out to do being completed. Even in traditional project management, I'm not as much talking about agile, but more like even this really solid PMP stuff, everyone talks about toll gates. I'm sure if you've ever been on a project, there's phase gates or there's milestones or there's checkpoints. And it's very well documented. The point of those is to assess on an ongoing basis whether the project should continue. Like the, everyone's trained to do that. I'll tell you from experience, I've never seen a project killed. I don't know if you've seen a project killed. I've never seen any project get to a toll gate and people actually legitimately assess, okay, this is not going to add the value we thought, or this is burning up too much money, or we need to change direction. Like to suggest killing a project to me is like being in a conference room and, and suggesting that we line up everyone working on the project in front of a firing squad. That would be killing the project. That's how people treat it. I mean, like no one stands up to say, yeah, you know, there's no sense in this anymore. We're really meeting a lot of resistance. The problem's changed. You know, you guys are spending a lot of money here, even though we're doing great work. I don't think we can continue to provide any ROI. That's like a dream. That's like a crazy world. Like if you heard anyone on a project team say that, I'd be in a multi, like I'd be in a parallel universe. I never, no one's encouraged to talk that way. Everyone will go down with the ship until the ship is totally sunk and like, smashed to smithereens on the coast i mean i've never seen a project with any sort of sensibility say we need to we need to kill the project have you ever seen a project killed in, in actual in real life right in the middle of never. it they're going to say it's successful and no certainly not in not in totality uh, ever <laughs> but if everybody was super focused on what problem they were trying to solve you know let's take the cut in the band-aid and there everyone realized oh there was it's, we're not bleeding you know, that would at least be a start. Then they'd have to defend why they're still doing the activity, which 100% will still exist, as opposed to having the cover of all, you know, we're just, our job is to find band-aids, you know, that, that's what we're doing. And, uh, and you know, you want to get into all this analysis and looking at the problem, whatever, you're just, you're slowing us down, your uh, um, you're, you're, you know, analysis paralysis or whatever it is, as opposed to, no, we still need to know because Every single day that that project continues is another day. If, if every if the company if everybody just inherited the company that day, they would still be spending money wastefully. They'd still be buying goodie bags. So, you know, then that's the whole present value sunk cost and all of that uh, kind well, of thing. Agile, yeah, well, agile was supposed to combat that too. That was part of the benefit that it was supposed to be that the project viability was reviewed in shorter bursts iteratively and you know in the sprint cycle but even then you see this doggedness now that you could be iterating crap over crap over crap and no one kills the actual project when it's just not working or like i said because of these things we're talking about the problem has been dissociated it's moved on it's been solved there's no energy for the project there's no one budget whatever team gets together will fight till the end i mean it's really the equivalent of your wife comes back with all these band-aid options and you're like, oops, I realized I don't even have a cut anymore. And, and her response is, you still need to pick one of these band-aids and I'm going to watch <laughs> you put it on because I did all this work to do it. You'd be like, what are you talking about? Let's rejoice that this is not something we have to continue with. And then we can let's, use our time for something more productive. Let's That's keep our domestic having... scenarios <laughs> out of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, this is something that I think intuitively one would say, yeah, now we can rejoice and move on to something more productive. But in the workplace, we all just get swept up and it's really hard to have that conversation. And honestly, it's a lack of presence. And I'm going to say, you know, people being present in a project situation is always paramount. I think it's like super important. Avoid that monomania we're talking about. Avoid this. A lot of times it's we set out to achieve a goal. And that's my goal. In some future state, it's going to happen. If everyone from the day the problem was set out to be solved was present with it, and every day they talked about how are we solving what we set out to do, and that was front of mind, then you would be able to have real conversations when the problem you know, shifted or like we should stop the project. Never. Never seen another. Another big solution would be, uh, or another way to uh, combat this, this problem that we're talking about would be if companies had a, did a much better job of separating their operations and projects and understood the distinction between the two. Because if you yeah. think of projects as being, you know, a choice, you know, something that you're spinning up um, and 
the objective of every project, you know, you know, I'm going to make a blanket blanket statement, which is pretty dangerous, but every project should either be growing your revenue or increasing your margin through efficiency, you know, of some sort, you know, or saving costs, you know, in, in some way. Um, so it's either an invest, it's an investment. And if you think of it as an investment, as opposed to like, you know, there's the food that you need to live, you know, the, the, the money you need to spend to live, you know, your basic necessities, and then there's choices, you know, in, in your life and, uh, um, you know, splurging on a vacation or whatever. If everybody would think of projects that way and that, that distinction between must have and, 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 and discretionary, which, and discretionary could be critical. You said, so don't get me wrong. There is a, the, 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 some companies need to, need projects to survive, you know, so, so it's, when I say discretionary, it's, it's still a choice amongst other activity because it's a distinction between what do I need to live and what do I, and what's, what's everything beyond that. And then every day that I'm spending on whatever that wasteful thing is. And, you know, people think of like, um, uh, you know, what, what are the, like a house that's a money pit or, or like the, there are a lot of things that you can imagine that you get personally attached to that you just, you know, you're sinking all or a classic car or some something that you restored or whatever. And you just sinking, sinking money, sinking money, maybe you're getting a benefit for it. But if, if it's choice between that or, or eating, you know, at some point, you're, you're going to realize that 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 distinction. And companies aren't doing that because operations projects aren't tightly thought of like that. And so it's all just critical um, work. Yeah. And that is super important, that, that distinction, because like you said, if you stop a project, if you conceptualize the project correctly, your business should still be able to function how it was before the project started. That's, I think, the summary point, right, that you're trying to make. Is, that, that's why if you're conflating the two, like my whole business is going to shut down if I kill this project, you're fundamentally thinking about projects incorrectly or like bringing way too much into it than, than you need to be. Yeah, because... It should, like I said, critical projects, yes, you may need them to survive in the long term, but if you ever have something you're calling a project that you need to survive right now today, you're probably conflating a bunch of different process stuff that's going on in your organization and probably not in a positive way. And, and bring it back to like uh, the transparency and everyone being on the same page as to the, the, the reason why. Another way of saying, you know, an element of what, of what we're saying is alignment. Everyone having the, the transparency allows everyone to align on what we're trying to what we're trying to solve for here. Now that has a benefit all on its own in terms of like organic, but you, we were talking about when it goes off the rails, the solution doesn't match you know, the objective. Forget that though. There's all this organic benefit that occurs when people understand why they're doing what they're doing because now they can contribute in ways that you might not have anticipated how they could contribute. So you, you're gonna see something, you know, a, a consistent theme from Sam and I about transparency. And we would probably argue for what, yeah, you know, what yeah. someone would call radical transparency, but no question that, uh, um, th that you lose that 100% when you assume that the only benefit that any worker can give you is to do this particular thing that was conceived in your head. That that's that's that that is incredibly limiting uh, on on anyone's opportunity, and especially your more creative uh, um, uh, employees are very likely going to use that creativity for something. So if they don't understand the problem you're trying to solve, they're going to try solving other problems, and that's another form of of all this waste. So I just want to bring that uh, you know that idea of alignment back. And I, and I think it's a good one because we should really, I'd like to shift here into, okay, so what do we do about this terrible monomania for solutions and, you know, this dissociation between the problem and the thing and transparency is, is obviously the number one and in transparency, again, we're presuming that let's say there's a legitimate problem and it's, it's sustainable. So let me start with that premise. Cause like Jonathan said, that's not always the case, but let's say you have a problem and like the cut situation, let's say you, you've identified a cut that's not going to heal on its own. That's the sustainable aspect. I, mean, I think that's important. So we have a stable problem that's not really, it's like internally driven. It's not affected too much by market or uncontrollable factors. And you know, it's solid and it needs to be looked at and you need to invest in solving it. Let's start from there. Cause that, that even is a lot <laughs> to start with. But from that point on the transparency is whoever articulated it, I would say, put it on a document. You know, I'm, again, I'm not lobbying for some heavy document, but write it down somewhere and then you need to always have it so that the project team can see it. That's the transparency we're talking about in practice. A hundred percent. I'd bring it up. I'd have it. I would have it somewhere. And, and uh, 
start every meeting with it. Like you, you the second every you meeting. Lose, that you, second you lose the tether to that problem that you're trying to solve, or if you've already, you know, if you built a, it's a complex project plan and you're going to have multiple mini solutions or objectives along the way to achieving the ultimate uh, objective uh, solution that you're um, that that you're looking for. Um, if everyone just needs to be and see what is why they're doing whatever they're doing and where it fits in, because then the few people that are always in the room that are saying, why are we in this meeting? This doesn't seem to make sense. They, it would be obvious to everybody. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're talking to almost like the managers who are making the projects and the execs. Let's talk to the majority of you who are listening who are most likely on project teams. If there is no problem or why we're doing the project that's provided to you, ask for it. Don't get caught on the other side of the problem in the beginning and just start executing without knowing you deserve it and you should ask for it because otherwise you're going to be doing a lot of crazy activity that you don't really know is tethered to anything substantial. That is a tough one though. That is a tough one to, <laughs> you, you're going to, you know, you go to manager and say, okay, why are we doing whatever we're doing? And it's like it, it, the same lack of transparency that started the project the way it did is they're going to be met with likely uh, um, in, in asking these questions. I agree though. The, the alternative is to find some meaning in implementing something that you don't know why. So you're going to invest some meaning to it that for all you know, can actually be harmful to the organization because there's no such thing that no solution is objectively good. It's impossible. Because if you don't know what's going on in an operation, I think we covered this in the transition state, you can't possibly tell me what the possible impact of that solution will be. It'd be like saying Band-Aids are, are, are good. Like, well, it depends, you know, they're Band-Aids plastic good. actually, they could be bad, you know, they're bad for the environment, you know, like, so like- The sticky part it, hurts your skin if you're not Exactly. Careful. There's no, there's no objective, there's no objectively good solution, although Obviously, whoever's selling the solution, they're, you know, they're marketing heavily, you know, they're very invested, you know, like you, you just have all these forces, you know, around that. But getting back to yeah. Sam's point, I think it's a critical one. And I think, you know, everybody sees this waste. It's been going on for a long time. It's, it's growing. <coughs> but we believe that there is a consciousness that's, that's, that's percolating and people are, 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 are really do want, uh, and, and there are some good, um, there's good information out there. They, they want to be part of the solution. They don't want to do meaning, meaning, meaningless work. Right. On the transparency thing too, we're talking about it. And yeah, that sounds pretty sensible. But so many times, I think it speaks to why would people be this transparent? A lot of times, still to this day, managers and executives who launch projects think that the information of why they're doing it, because honestly, most projects drive down to cost problems or some sort of, you know, P&L or profit. It's got to have a profit driver the majority of the time. They don't want it. They're reluctant to share financial information with people. They won't say that we need to cut this much cost or that we're struggling in this financial area or whatever. And my answer is, if you don't feel like you can be honest with your team when the project is on the onset, you may not want to start the project. So like, if you're going to sit there and argue with me that you can't be transparent because this is sensitive information, my response would be, I'm not going to... Take that carte blanche. You need to interrogate that because if you go in and say, you know, this is a cost cutting project and here's a solution that I think is going to solve it. And you just go to your teams and say, here's a solution we all need to figure out what to do. And you don't tell them that we're under cost pressure, we have a financial target, we have something we need to achieve, or we're going to be under operating duress financially. That's like, that's the equivalent of what we've been talking about all podcasts, which seems silly, which is that you cut yourself, you're bleeding profusely. And you just walk into the room with your hand over your eye and say, I need somebody to make me a bandage. Other than that, there's nothing else you need to know. And then you walked out. That's what people do all the time with the finance stuff. You can't have a team help you if you don't tell them what you need help with. 100%. And, and there, let, I'll take an extreme example. Let's say the objective of whatever solution you're trying to do is going to reduce headcount. And so you say, and that, that's, that's what you want to do. You want to reduce headcount. So you say, well, how transparent can we be about that? Because if everybody knew that, you know, that's going to be a problem. We can't say, hey, we need you to work on this because we, we, we want to reduce you, you know, or something like that. <laughs> yeah. um, 
but that that's actually a perfect example because I would say that you can plan, you can build a plan for exactly that reaction. You can build in ways and, and incentives for people to, you know, to stay, et cetera. You can get ahead of it. When you're not transparent, it's not like people don't figure this out. You know, in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the lack of transparency. It's like being in a room that's dark. It might not be very dangerous, the room, but there's a, a sharp edge here or whatever. If it's dark, someone's gonna get hurt always. And so at the end of the day, it's better to put the light on and, every, and then you, everybody could walk, you know, in, in a safe way and you can plan for whatever the dangers are. And in this case, if, if it's a matter of reducing headcount, like I said, there, there, there are incentives or whatever it is. And, and more interestingly, you know, I talked about organic opportunity, the, the only times that I see transformations or change occur <clears throat> is when entities are that transparent because people self-select. And the very people that get that are able to change and able to uh, come out of their current operating state and, and figure out a new way of doing something, they're the ones that you're going to be able to identify through this transparent process. So again, a very, very uh, simple example, but I think, uh, uh, um, I, I hope helpful. I think so. And as we get to the end here, I'm hesitant to open up a huge philosophical topic on this because there could be a whole podcast series on how being more honest in business actually leads to better financial outcomes. So it's not just some pithy 100%. philosophical honesty is the best policy type of adage. It's really well studied out, especially from a process perspective that the more honest and the more transparent you can be, it promotes better process. It promotes better productivity. It combats directly the problem we're articulating in this podcast, which is people getting dissociated from what they're attempting to achieve. I mean, there's just so many things around it. But generally, if you ever find yourself in a room as an employee or as a manager on the on one side or the other of project work, and you find yourself having to bend the truth or make stuff up or make up reasons behind your behavior, or you know, as soon as you start to find yourself straying from like a very straightforward, truthful guidance it should be a red flag. It should be a red flag that, you know, it's not even that like some sort of moral red flag I'm preaching about. It's that you're going to start to reduce project effectiveness and you're going to be starting to be contributing to the problem and not the solution. And I think that's something we all need to keep at the forefront when we're talking about transparency. You're never going to cheat that. I want to give one more image in mind. If you, let's say if you're building a sandcastle, you know, and if, and if, if your whole world is that sandcastle, you know, the solution and you're not looking at uh, you know, the, the bigger picture, within two seconds, you could do everything you do and it could just be washed away. And that's the equivalent of doing a project without knowing the reason why. And it, because you ultimately might have something that's helpful, not helpful, but it, it won't stand the test of time because you're not developing your capability as an entity um, and you're not uh, ultimately able to uh, um, uh, get rid of the waste. So I don't know if that was a great analogy, but I just, uh, I was trying to think of something that's wasteful that, you know, that person wouldn't want to do, and they have to be able to see the logical conclusion of whatever it is that, that they're engaged in. Well, and I, I think it's, I think it's applicable in many ways. And, and I think the biggest thing when we're talking about transparency too, and just your day-to-day -day and being present again on project work, if you realize that you're building a sandcastle because the requirements were, were resulting in that, and maybe other people don't see it you should call it out. And that's again, back to the, the, we were talking about the hesitancy that people have in calling out their own project as being wasteful and they'll just bring it to their grave with them. That's not helpful. But you know, I know there's a lot of things that we've been trained and have been indoctrinated in us from a young age, like even the simplest one, like you're a quitter and that's a bad thing. Like if I call you a quitter, most of you will have a visceral reaction to that. It's like, I'm not a quitter. I can see this through. I have perseverance. We've been trained to think that way. And there's a thousand little things like that with the current workforce training you to be persevering against adversity, training you to be a team player, to try to find the solution. Trying to make a sandcastle work when you know it's a sandcastle is mm -hmm. only serving you. And no one, like, we have to have more consciousness on both sides of the fence on these topics. Because if I was your manager, I would want you to tell me that this project is leading us to a sandcastle that's going to get washed away when the next big wave comes up and we're not going to have any value from this over the long term. I would want you to tell me that. And I and, wouldn't and, call you a quitter. I'd say, this is great. 
right? Because then you could say, oh, okay, so we're building something beautiful, you know, via moment in time. That's wonderful. But I'll know not to put in, you know, try doing concrete or, you know, you know, steel reinforcement. So you, you'll know the parameters of what activity makes sense in that context, as opposed to the alternative. Yeah, and it's all wrapping back around to success is not the perseverance and dogged chasing of activity and finishing what you start. I want everyone to get, I guess it's coming back around to my ultimate consulting philosophy, which is stop doing things if they don't make any 100%. sense. You don't have to finish. You don't, it's okay. Everyone who's listening, you don't have to finish what you started. Be honest. Just always be here today and tell me if this makes sense or not. I think if we, you know, that I think if we could change the culture from people saying things like I have an action to buy, you know, or I have a bias to action, um, and more to I have a bias to not doing wasteful things, you know, I think because yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, our philosophy definitely would be if everyone would just anyone who's doing anything wasteful would just stop and the whole org in, in with throughout an organization, what a beautiful thing because maybe everyone would suddenly see, wow, all the value still being produced and not all this flurry of activity. So we have all this capacity now to do something useful with. <laughs> yeah, the bias to action. That's a really great, one of my favorites that I, I absolutely can't stand. It's like, I would love for everyone to say, I have a bias to taking a deep breath and considering what I'm doing right now as it relates to the a problem that I was trying to solve. Does that sound very sexy? Probably not. It kind of sounds like somebody who's sort of just slowly considering from day to day what's going on. But that's what we need. That's what we need to do good work. Uh, yeah, it's just. I'll set up. I'll set up because it, I think we're leading to. We're going to have to do a podcast soon about you know defining the problem. But when Albert yeah, Einstein yeah. says, "If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend fifty-five minutes on the analyzing it, and then five minutes on the solution," you know, that's not a bias for action. You didn't just start getting up and you know running around doing all this activity. It's consider how am I going to be most effective? Do I actually have a problem, etc.? So everyone that quote seems to work for everybody, but. It's, nobody actually applies it. Well, like a lot of things we talk about, the logic makes sense. When you're listening it, and hopefully for those of you listening now, it's like, okay, this is stuff that seems intuitive. But when you're in the meeting or you're in the conference room and they're saying, what have you done? Where are we on our targets? Where are we against our next deadline? Are you that person that says, does that deadline make sense? Do we still need to be driving toward it? That seems a lot more scary all of a sudden, but that's the application in context of what we're talking about. And that's the hard part. But staying consistent is our challenge. Staying consistent with what we know to be fundamentally true and, and good work and good decision making. And then applying it when you're under pressure and you have management that needs your help and they're just driving activity. Don't let the why get lost. That's really the, the this whole podcast is know why you're doing work. Have everyone aligned on that. And if you're the one who's generating it, have it out there front and center and make sure that every day that's the only thing you're talking about because that's the problem can change because the solution can change. As long as you, you keep them linked together, you will be in good shape and you're having honest conversations about it. And if you don't have the why and no one's giving it to you, posit one that links the activity and at least see if that, if maybe you could supply the why, you know, just yeah. to get the conversation going. But uh, that'll be the last, let my, at least my last word on the topic today. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really great stopping point. So we'll stop there. And like I said, we've introduced some even more exciting topics. Problem analysis is my uh, is one of my arch nemesis in terms of the business science. So we'll hopefully have a fulfilling conversation about that in a future topic. But until then, thanks for joining us and we'll talk soon. See you next week.